I'm going to talk to you about uh, memory and uh, C++ debugging at Electronic Arts. Um, I'm going to talk to you about it in a bunch of eras. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about you know what we used to do back when game programming was more like embedded programming back in 2000 on PS2. Uh, then I'll start talking about uh, you know how things were back on 360 when we got virtual memory for the first time and ESDL came about. Uh, <laughs> Finally, I'm going to talk about um, you know things now with uh, PS4 and Xbox One, and uh, I'm going to show you a sneak peek of what our current uh, sort of state-of-the-art uh, debugging tools. Um, this is me. Uh, I've been in games forever. Uh, I like to try and solve problems uh, visually and draw pictures and do animations and stuff. Uh, that probably got me into games, and. <clears throat> I'm badly dyslexic, uh, so if you see any spelling mistakes, please let me know. Uh, I won't have noticed them. Uh, so on that note, let's start with vocabulary, one of my favorite topics. Um, <clears throat> um, in, in memory debugging systems and things, I've always noticed that there seems to be a lot of different vocabularies around, like heaps and arenas and allocators and pools, and so this is the, what I'm going to use. I'm going to talk about allocators, and they will be uh, a class that can uh, free or allocate memory. Uh, usually it's a pure virtual interface. And then I'm going to talk about arenas, and arenas are like a set of address ranges where you can find an allocator from it. And so you can go back and forth um, from an allocator to finding what address ranges is, is in, or you can take any particular pointer in memory and and find out what arena that's in, and therefore you know what allocator it's from. And heap, sometimes I'll say quite a bit, and that's kind of the combination of a two, the two. So back in 2000, you know, we just started converting from C. I mean, most people turned on their C++ compilers by this point. Uh, we didn't have any virtual memory. There was no OS. Uh, you know, very similar to embedded programming systems and very sim uh, simple systems. Only 32 megs of RAM. So what I started seeing uh, about, you know, how to get debugging information into the game uh, and how to debug all of the allocations uh, was like techniques like this one, where people would add news and deletes to all of their classes. Uh, and you know, this is actually a good idea for performance sake. I mean, people use like fixed sized pools and slabs of allocators where they, they bump pointers uh, and things like that. But if you're trying to use this as a debug technique, you know, it falls down because you're having to, you know, if you don't do this somewhere, you won't really notice. If you don't override your new and delete in a location, then you just miss having the extra tracking information. We still have code like this around uh, in EA, uh, but it's something that I would suggest not to do. But I understand why library teams do it, because this is sometimes hard on a very large project. You want to use global new and uh, global delete, but what interface do you use? What kind of debugging parameters uh, do you use? In a very large company like EA, it was actually kind of tricky to get the, the politics of this right. Eventually, we settled on something like this, um, where we had some flags which said whether we were on the top of RAM or the bottom of RAM. Uh, and we had a debug name that would be associated with every single allocation. Um, to understand how we use that debug name, you kind of have to understand what a heap looks like uh, for us anyways. And, Usually it's got a header, you know, an allocated block and a footer, and this is pretty simple. Um, but we would store in the footer this debug name, and we would put it there and be, you know, fresh for being corrupted, because uh, that's usually what the memory you would corrupt. Uh, maybe not the best of places to put it. Um, and it would look like this. It would be like category colon colon allocator. So we would have things like, you know, rendering colon colon player or, or gameplay colon colon physics mesh or those kind of things, and we would store it there. And this was pretty good tech, we thought, and it was good. Um, you know, it was simple back then because we didn't really have very many pools or anything because there wasn't that much RAM, only tens of thousands of objects, I guess. Um, <clears throat> 
we did have uh, a small block allocator, and this wasn't quite used everywhere, but pretty close. And we had to work really hard at fragmentation. And we thought this was the height of technology at the time. You would load compressed blocks in the bottom of RAM and then decompress them and put them in the top of RAM, and that's what we would use those, those flags for, is for doing things like this. And you ping pong things back and forth. Uh, to get rid of all of the fragmentation. And this worked pretty well as long as you only had one CPU. Once, of course, we went to Xbox 360 and uh, PS3, our world had to change, though. We had virtual memory now, though, and this was a real good advantage. You didn't have a hard drive, though, so we couldn't really use it the same way everybody else could. Um, and the GPUs couldn't support it, and that's where a lot of our memory actually went. So it wasn't perfect, but it was definitely an improvement. Having all of those CPUs um, meant that we wanted to have more allocation systems and, and divide memory up a little bit more so we didn't have um, contention on it and, and fragmentation would become a, a sort of a higher level problem. <clears throat> uh, we needed better tracking and, and logging systems. Uh, and we invented something we call the stomp allocator uh, and that was a, a huge advance in how we debugged memory corruption. Uh, finally, uh, STL came into existence, and this really algorithmically changed the way we worked. And that was really powerful. But how did we deal with having multiple allocators? Uh, for the most part, it's pretty simple. I mean, you just pass an extra parameter to your new operator, and it can kind of work. And that's what we did. Delete, however, is a pain. And so therefore, we had to wrap it in a macro and a crazy amounts of technology to pass in an extra parameter in order to call the, the appropriate destructor. Uh, we still use that code today, and occasionally we think, hmm, why don't we have it so we can pass in a, you know, an extra parameter delete? Might be nice. Um, we also had to think about you know, how are we going to divide up memory? Um, you know, how do we decrease fragmentation if we can't sort of ping pong back and forth as much? So what we did was we kind of divided it based on time, is sort of the most important, and size. And by time, I mean like static allocations. They allocate once and they never get freed. Global allocations, they, you know, have a lifetime longer than a level anyways, and so they're passing information between levels like your front end system or something like that. Uh, and you'd have sub-level uh, information that, you know, maybe a, a cut scene that happens during a level. And the level pool could just disappear after a level was done, and so you could figure out that your whole system was in a steady state. You'd also have various types of temporary allocations for things like, okay, bullets are flying around. Um, you know, they only last for a few frames. We'd also do things by size, too where you, you know, just like your cupboards or something like that, you take all your big pots and pans and you put them into one location, and you take all of your smaller ones and put them somewhere else. We had the small block allocator like I was talking about, and that's actually a completely a custom system. But we actually would even just use general allocators and put different size things in different directions, uh, and this actually reduced fragmentation. One thing that it sort of depended on the size of team that we had, whether we did this or not, but we'd also break it up kind of on the, the boundaries, the political boundaries, if you will, of, of the team. Uh, and you would then have like uh, generic heaps and small block allocator heaps uh, for, for each team. Uh, th this is actually a performance disadvantage, really, and smaller teams wouldn't want it. But, but big teams did because, you know, it was very easy to, to set blame for things. Um, you know, if you were on a smaller team, you'd probably do something like this and just tag the allocations uh, uh, based on categories. And you can see that there's, you know, you can just count up the orange blocks and count up the red blocks. And you could see how much memory was, was being uh, taken up and set budgets based on that. And, and that's a really good thing to do. But, you know, you're going to have things like fragmentation. And, Fragmentation, you know, is hard. Like, who's at fault? Who, who did it? And when you have things like memory corruption, 
between teams, it's quite interesting too. You know, your shadows are suddenly being corrupted. Of course you're gonna blame the rendering team, they wrote the shadow system, it must be their fault. But they're gonna be pretty upset at you when you told them to fix their bugs and then they figure out that it's actually, you know, people writing the sim code and they went in and corrupted one of their buffers. And so that's really too bad. Along the same line, we started to notice that it was important to keep our debugging information safe from the rest of our system. Uh, there was some really important information there and we could use it to determine what was actually going on around the corruption. You could, you know, memory effectively looked like this and you had, you know, the traditional header, allocated block, footer, normal heap there and you would have a separate heap that was a debug heap that you would track by address and that address would be a hash key. So it was kind of like a, a, a hash table that would be implemented. And you would use that hash uh, in order to figure out how to free it. So it wasn't completely free what we were able to do there, but this, this concept of tracking all of our live allocations somewhere else safe um, meant that when you saw corruption in a, a rendering block or, or something like that, you could take it, dump it out after you crashed, look at the previous block and find out, oh, it's a gameplay block and it's this size and you'd know a bunch of properties about it and then you could write code to test for um, bugs and things based on it. And that was really good. You'll notice that there's something else going on here. There's this whole memory logging system as well. We would take, um, maybe we wouldn't be able to run the whole game this way, but, but sections of the game anyways, uh, maybe one pool at a time or one team's worth of memory at a time, and stream it out to disk, change by change, every single transaction we did with the memory system, and, and write it out so we'd know where every alloc and free was. And we would do this so that we could write a tool like this one, where you can see the, you know, the start of time to end of time, and you can see that memory is slowly going up here, right? Um, uh, this is our game going through boot flow uh, as we go through um, a bunch of changes and we load various files. Um, you can sort of see what's going on. You can, here, you could, pick any particular point in time and you could see a snapshot of what was going on and, and see it down in the spreadsheet below. But the other thing you could do is you could select regions and you could see the delta changes that, that happened there besides just seeing a whole snapshot. And you would have, you know, information like you would expect um, to be able to debug the system. You would have, you know, the heap it was from, the, the category it was in, allocation names, uh, the number of count of items and um, allocation sizes. You could also get a, a call stack as well, um, but that isn't in this diagram. You could also see like a block of diagram of it and you could see the thing I was talking about before with, with categories. You could see that the, the systems guys are all allocated over there and the, the presentation information uh, is down in purple there. You can see that we have some fragmentation in this heap because gray is free and you can see there's more than one section of, of gray. And you could highlight blocks and find out um, you know, attributes about it, you know, what the size of this block was, where it was in memory, and you could see things that were going on around it. And if you had memory corruption or something like that, this, this was very useful to, to sort of reason about what was going on. The other thing that we added um, was something called Stomp Allocator. Uh, of course, we're working on consoles, so we can't use the same teams, uh, the same tools that everybody else would, like Valgrind and things like this, so we end up invite, in, in inventing some of our own. I think this one is uh, similar to Electric Fence, where we would use the virtual memory system to allocate a read-write page and then a read-only page right afterwards, and we would stuff our allocation right at the bottom. And if we, you know, had an array inside there and you walked off, you would immediately crash and stop and you would get a call stack and you would know exactly where your bug was. And we could find tons of memory corruption with this, this tool. Now, because we 
over allocate uh, using the system, we couldn't use it everywhere. I mean, we have no memory left. I mean, when you're working on an Xbox 360, especially near the end of its life cycle, we were scraping back memory by, you know, reducing code space and all sorts of craziness. So how we use these tools is we would have all the attributes of allocations and we would only apply them to a small set at a time. So as we saw memory corruption happening in particular regions, we could turn this on to, you know, all gameplay allocations that are between 256 bytes to, you know, uh, maybe 300 bytes or something like that, a very small range of memory, uh, and we could test it. One other thing I learned around this time was the pains of ref pointers. Uh, I first saw them and I was thought, oh, great. I should use these everywhere, and I started to. And uh, as quickly as I started to use them everywhere, I ran into this problem, and uh, oh boy. Uh, I started ripping them out as fast as I could, and I never wanted to use them again. But I, I, I've learned my lesson now. Uh, really, they are very useful, especially in multi-threaded situations, uh, things like that. Uh, I think I would start with unique pointer or bare pointers to start because I've got these great debugging systems to track all these allocations. You know, fighting memory leaks really isn't that hard for me. What's hard is tracking down circular dependencies because I'm not really set up for it. I might be able to solve this problem. I think it's called garbage collection. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I would start from there because I think they've solved it, uh, solved it quite well. Uh, I could implement a logging system too. I mean, I could log every single, you know, uh, ad ref and dec ref in my entire system, but that's gonna be a lot of memory. Way more than the number of blocks of memory I have, because the number of blocks of memory, I have so many more pointers, and, and how many times I use those pointers is how many times I might end up uh, ink refing and dec refing. So, the other thing that happened at this time was STL. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, we decided to use STL uh, and not use uh, standard. Um, uh, the standard library, we ended up inventing our own ESTL. Uh, but basically it came down to speed for our particular case. Uh, this is on Visual Studio 2015. Uh, it, but it's kind of been the same for quite a while. I tried it on uh, uh, 2012 as well, and the results are a little similar. I, this is a, a bunch of tests. This is a benchmark, and so I don't know. Maybe the benchmark isn't that good, but out of the 188 tests that, that I had, um, uh, 71 uh, cases, we are 30% faster. Uh, there's 10 which we're slower, and we know what they are. Um, we you know, they're not cases that we normally use or, or we wanted to go for memory or something instead. Uh, with the, the debug case, it's really interesting, actually. We're way faster. Um, we're way faster because we cut and paste more code. Uh, the inliner doesn't really work when you have functions that call other functions that call other functions. And so it isn't really that good. So we just kind of flattened the whole thing. Uh, hopefully we got it right and didn't write that many bugs because I'm guessing that's why, you know, STL and things don't do that. Um, one thing is really cool is we're gonna open source ESTL, like for real. Um, yay. Uh, so Rob over here is gonna take pull requests and things once we get all set up. Uh, keep an eye on uh, this place here on uh, GitHub and uh, you'll see it soon. Uh, we'll talk about the details to the SG14 group and. Uh, I don't know, we, we just barely decided all this stuff, so uh, hopefully I'm not causing any trouble with this. Uh, so, but even though we invented our own version of STL, we didn't all think of the same thing and the same vision, uh, I guess. You know, allocators, for example, do you want them to be polymorphic or do you not? Well, we couldn't decide on that. Um, ours had state and things in them, so we had more something towards the allocators that are in uh, 20, uh, 2011. So we could use them sort of like this, where we would be able to override and, and use our iCore allocators, um, which is our allocation interface, and we could use them everywhere. 
Uh, and this worked okay. It was not bad. But you had this problem. You have a lot of default parameters. And if you keep things exactly the same interface as STL, which is what we wanted to do, you had to pass in all of this stuff that you didn't want to pass in. And so it was a pain to use. Uh, you know, this is okay, but it's not great. Uh, another way to solve the problem was this. Um, you could have your vector and you could call get allocator and then set allocator on it and change it each time. And the STL, the way it works is you, you guarantee that it will not allocate memory right away. Uh, it will only allocate memory once you push something into it. And so that, that worked okay. And, and our team's a pretty big team, and so sometimes we think we can get away with just changing the interface. Uh, and we shouldn't at least try to do these bad ones. Um, so this was me. Uh, I added it, our system allows us to look up allocators by name. And so I decided that was a good idea, and that was not a good idea, and fortunately nobody took it, and it should die one of these days, but there's a lot of code that looks like that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, that happens with, uh, you know, allocators and things is this kind of problem. Uh, I, I'm guessing many people would know the problem here. Does people know what the problem here is? I don't know. Good. Yeah. All right. This is compiler. doesn't work. Um, there are different types, right? They're both vectors of type int, but because their uh, allocators are different, it doesn't know what to do, and so it explodes. So we invented another thing. Uh, this is only internally, in, and so I don't know if we're going to make this public, but, but I think we should because it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, we took and wrapped all of uh, STL. I, I wouldn't suggest that, that everybody does this, but if you've got a large enough system, maybe this is an idea. And we changed the order of parameters for ourselves so that we could pass in the information, and we made sure that the allocator was always first, because I was telling all the engineers, you have to pass in an allocator. Of course, they would tell me that, you know, if I have to pass in an allocator to everywhere, it's really hard to write my map of list of strings. And then I would say, please do not write a map of list of strings, at least use a hash table of, you know, vectors of strings. Um, but, uh, you know, that sort of thing worked well enough. It was, it was sort of good, and um, you know, it got people, like if I gave it to a junior engineer, they could figure it out. Uh, we continued it for a bit more so that we could, for a large system, if you were writing like 70 files or something like this, uh, C files or something, things on this scale starts making stents or so, um, where you could make your own string type for that large system. So in our career mode case, we would make you know, a new string type for it. And, and we, would, we would know that we just wanted to use the same allocator each time, and it was fine. Um, it, was, it was close enough. And because of the way we did the inheritance here, you can see it's inheriting from uh, STL uh, vector in this case, although it probably should be string, I guess. Um, <clears throat> we could the inheritance, because this would work out, the allocators are the same, the type's the same, and um, I don't get a compiler error anymore. And so now I can transfer the types between them. Uh, this will copy the, the data, so from um, the localization string, and it would copy it into the career mode string, and that's what we wanted to achieve, because you know, localization is supposed to be sort of like a factory and so therefore it's supposed to be producing strings for the other system, and career mode should be owning it, because it has a duration of time. Career, career mode starts and it ends, and so therefore I can tell if all the strings got freed at some point, and, and I can write systems that, that prove that's the case. And so this fixes my ownership issue, which is uh, quite useful. Um, so now we're off to today. So today, uh, we obviously have even more memory. We have 64-bit addresses, so that's really good. We have hard drives uh, on all of the consoles, so we're allowed to use them now. The GPUs are not quite virtual memory, but they're getting close, and we're even allowed to not have linear textures for them, and so that's really good. So that means our debugging system should change again. And ESDL tracking, we took another crack at it, and Finally, I'm gonna talk about our new debugging tools that uh, we've been developing in-house. 
So one thing that started happening around this time is, you know, that people started throwing out the debug name. It started not necessarily being the way we wanted to solve problems. Uh, we still passed in uh, an I-Core allocator pointer everywhere, so we still had our polymorphic allocator everywhere. But we wanted to do things like this, where we wanted to associate a lot more data with our allocations, uh, not just associate a debug name, because before we would you know, associate a debug name and say if we loaded a file, we might make the debug name equal to the file, but we couldn't tell that it was a resource or something like that, so this came from this resource. And with scopes, we could. So scopes is maybe the way we should go. I mean, we have to use more um, thread local storage and things, and so there's some performance-related problems there, but we started using scopes quite a bit, and most of the debug information that we're trying to push in now is going this way. Um, we still have the old interfaces. Uh, of course, nothing ever dies, um, but it, it's, it's working pretty well. So, so our code kind of looks like this. Uh, we knew, we passed in an allocator, uh, we knew a team, uh, you know, ESTL is sort of still a problem. It's not quite fitting. I mean, we invented this EA Stilica. Uh, I guess I didn't say it. EA Stilica, by the way, is supposed to be pronounced like Metallica, and uh, uh, it's EA STL I Core Allocator. Uh, sorry, I didn't explain that before, but uh, it's brutal to pronounce. <laughs> uh, so. What we started to do with ESTL, like, because we wanted to solve it in a cleaner way, you could have an arena, like a gameplay arena or a level arena, it doesn't really matter which, and you could allocate, you know, your team, your home team or whatever, and maybe it has a team ID and a vector of players. And of course, everyone knows what a vector is going to have in it. It's going to have an allocator, which might be zero bytes, you know, first, last, end pointer. Um, but what you can do is you could check what arena that allocator would have been in. And you can do this really fast, and probably everybody can do it this day really fast, is because if you've got delete to work, and it's going really fast, you must have global delete. You must have some way to implement global delete and look up your pointer and figure out how you should free this global pointer. Um, and so, because every team could implement this, this means we could use that information as a parameter to decide where the players should go. It didn't have to be exactly the same pool. I mean, we could do slightly different things. We could decide that players should go in a small block allocator, for example. But if you think about this, you know, who owns, what team owns this information? Well, probably it's the same people that created it. What lifetime is it going to have? Well, the teams created it. Players probably live as long as the team, maybe. You know, well, that's, that's you know, probably making a pretty good guess. It, at least it's better than what we were doing before. I mean, what would we do before? I mean, we would just allocate these things in global and be done with it, I guess, and that's really wrong. Uh, there's lots of interesting little problems with this. I mean, it's not free. Uh, you have to spend some time to look up what arena this thing is in. Uh, is that a great thing to do? I don't know. Uh, move operators. Obviously, if you want to change ownerships between systems, it's not going to work. It's going to move the vector, but it's not going to move the underlying allocation of all of the players. But it works 80% of the time, and maybe that's good enough. You made it, you own it, not a bad rule. Um, for other cases, maybe you could use an Eastilica-like pattern. That's a good idea. Um, you know, for a factory, like localization or something like that, where you, you didn't want to keep ownership uh, of everything you created. Maybe that's a good idea. So, Finally, I'm going to talk about Delta, Delta Viewer, which is a tool we've been working on inter internally to show how we've combined together all of our debugging tools and, and tried to um, be able to see them in, in, in one environment and try and show you why we need that. And what we do is we we debug sessions of data, and a session, what I mean by that is when you play a game, you keep playing it until you crash or quit, and crashing is actually fairly common when it, you're working on it. So 
Um, and all of this data, you stream it out to the SE's machine. And there's a server that runs on each SE's machine to collect up all of this data, or on the QA's machine if it's uh, you know, being run by QA. All of this data is stored in tables, and these tables are then in view, so it's basically a database on everybody's machine. Um, but that's actually really useful because we can build these views around it and, and, and have all of these views work with each other. So some of our popular views are sort of like a printf TTY channel kind of like thing. We have um, I.O. profiling, so load profiling, frame rates, uh, jobs profiling, threads, those kind of information. Uh, we also have you know, a memory investigator tool which helps us see changes in memory over time. And we have another sort of categorization system. And the categorization system sort of groups together allocations and allows us to, to see things at a high scale. So with TTY, even just TTY systems, you get kind of an interesting thing going on here. You can see channels, and in this case, I'm looking at only one channel, and this is LTC, which is load time channel. And so I can see when load time started and ended uh, in this game, and I can see when level two happened. I know the data very well, and that's why I'm having to highlight it. And so I've got a primitive little um, you know, profiler right here, and so that's kind of cool. That's, that's a neat idea all on its own. It's nice to get the printfs off of the machine because uh, printfs are actually, uh, on some consoles, are very, very expensive. But of course, you know, that's a pretty primitive thing and, uh, you know, maybe you'd want a, a more better version of a load profiler. And this is what we have and it's actually maybe overly complicated, but um, I'll give you the highlights anyways, which is there's this load profiler and it has a timeline there and time goes from one side to the other. Uh, and, and we have this concept called bundles, and we group together files that we're gonna load together, and then we load them all at once. And this is better for seeks and things. We also have things like chunks, which are you know, like parts of movies and parts of video, uh, and terrain and open world games and that sort of thing, like sort of sub parts of files. And Bundles really tell me when I'm going to get in my next level or sub-level, and so usually they're kind of, you know, when they're done, then you're finished loading. And what you can do with these two views, the TTY channels and the load time profilers, you can combine them together. You can see the printfs in the load time view, and you can see when they happen. And, you know, this is like adding events to it. And that's really cool. You can see when you were loading level one. You can see when you're playing the game. You can see when you're playing level two. You can see when you're, uh, you know, actually loading level two, when you're playing level two. And you can see that I haven't actually finished loading when I'm playing, which is kind of odd and I probably should have done. If you actually played the game, unfortunately, I don't have a video to go with it. It's a feature we're going to add, but we haven't done yet. If you hover over top of that file, you can find out that, that crowds aren't loaded yet. And if you're playing the game, you could actually see that the crowds sort of pop in as the game was playing, and that isn't very good. We fixed that bug, and that was good. Next thing is as a load profiler. And if you know anything about games, of course, games are broken up into frames. And the, the, the height of each one of these things is, is a frame. And so higher it is, worse it is. And so in this case, that is a very expensive frame, and that is not allowed. You've got to hammer that guy down somehow or another. Um, you can highlight what's going on there, and that's what's going on there in blue, is I actually highlighted this one. And all of that information shows up down there at the bottom. And you can see this expensive frame. You can see when it started and when it ended, and you can see it's slightly bigger than all the rest. All of that noise there is a thing called jobs, and jobs, let's just call them callbacks that happen on another thread. And then you can see the function stacks as you, you, you know, pop back and forth uh, happening over and over. Uh, they're not complete call stacks, but you know, most of it is there. 
one thing I noticed, because I know this game really well, and in some games this is not the case, but we shouldn't be waiting for render. A lot of games are highly coupled. Our game can slide back and forth um, three or four frames between our rendering and our, and our sim. Uh, and so I shouldn't have this. All of these yellow things should be gone, and this particular yellow happened to be really expensive because the GPU was a little slow. And once, once I removed all of the yellow, everything ran a whole lot better. But you can still combine together more of these views. And it, you need to do this because during load time, the whole machine is running. You're not just spinning the, you know, the disk and trying to load things up. You have to you know, load things, and then you'll have to decompress them because uh, loading compressed things are faster. And then you'll have the texture or whatever, and you'll start stomping names or something on it with a font. And then from there, you know, because the, writing the names is easy in 32 bits or whatever, you, you want to compress it down and make it a smaller type of texture because the GPU would be happier to run on that smaller type. And you know the color reduction and stuff is just going to work. Sometimes that is done in the GPU, but a lot of these things are CPU limited. So you can see here in 4K glory, which uh, uh, is really hard to use, read for everybody, but you get the idea. Um, that I've got Turbo Tuner up at the top, I've got uh, my frame rate meter there, and I can view all of what's going on in all of the CPUs. I can highlight um, what's going on on the Turbo Tuner uh, to see what's going on and what file I.O. is going on in a particular location. And what I'll see is I'll see, you know, these frames are bad, and I can see what file I.O. is going on there, or I can see Around this file I.O., is my frame rate good? You know, what kind of processing is happening right after these files? And I can do it either way. So no matter which one I select, the other one gets selected uh, at the same time. And all of that ends up showing up on the bottom. And I can see what's going on and sh see my one big frame and what's going on in every single CPU and the GPU as well. In this case, I actually don't know what the bug is yet. I haven't figured that out, so I'll have to spend some more time on it, but <clears throat> soon. Now, memory is kind of an interesting thing, especially memory leaks. It's funny, if I ever, if I, you just Google memory leaks, uh, you'll get some strange advice, and they say, hey, make sure that you free all of your memory when you shut it down, and I'm always like, really? I don't know, I just delete my process. Uh, the OS is better at it than me. Uh, I mean, it's not that, that doing that in debug mode or something isn't useful, I guess, but really what you want is to put the machine in some steady state and make sure that you never go above certain high watermarks and stuff, because you know, if you're working on consoles, you only have so much memory and you, you, you don't want to lose performance and swap things out to disk or something like that. So the way I look at memory leaks, what I would call a memory leak, is I capture allocations between a particular period of time like, okay, loading level one from the beginning of the load to the end of the load. I've probably loaded most of my big assets there for the level. And then I can make sure that those are unloaded by the time I'm getting to level two because I don't want that high watermark. So, for example, if I've got this allocation at time T1, I want to make sure that it's freed before C. In this case, it's freed after C. It is freed but it's still a leak because it's adding to my high watermark. I said it was going to be free and it is not. And so I need to go dig into this and find out what that problem is. So what you can do is you can look at TurboTuner and you can determine where e, A, B, and C are. You can go find out that, you know, okay, my level one loading is here. And by C, all of those allocations better be gone and then you can see that I've got a big, leak, big list of memory leaks here, which kind of sucks. But fortunately, I have good information. I know what scope they're from. I know what their pointer, their size. I know their call stack IDs. I know a highlighted item, which, full, you know, the full call stack there. Uh, I'll know what assets were associated with that location. So I have lots of all of this sort of metadata with each allocation. And so that's really powerful. 
I can see other things besides just this sort of ABC memory link thing. Um, there's other modes, and I can do similar things to the previous tool where I can, you know, just highlight two points and see what growth I had or something like that. But um, I think this is, is pretty useful. You can also do memory categorization with this tool. Uh, and this is data driven, and you can sort of scrub between two times. You can, you know, start before the level's loaded and after the level loaded, and you can see how much memory goes up. In this case, you know, it goes from 2.6 gigs to 3.3 or so. I think this is kind of interesting because, you know, <clears throat> everybody kind of wonders what goes on in games, and really I think they're very similar to a lot of programs. And, you know, I have 2.2 million allocations. 2.1 are smaller than 512 bytes. So, this means my debugging systems, really I'm focused on this number here. I have to figure out how I'm gonna debug this large number of, of small block allocations and deal with that scale. On the other hand, my memory leak system, when I'm trying to figure out, you know, am I gonna run out of RAM or something, I really should pay attention to the higher numbers where I've only got 208 allocations and somehow or another that adds up to two gigs. That was surprising for me. But these are allocations that are larger than, than two megs. So, you know, they're big. And I think that happens with, with many uh, programs. There's sort of this exponential curve that goes on. The other thing is, is like I was saying, this is data driven. So by loading another YAML file, I can look at it in a different way. I could see how many cars and how much cars took up. I could see how much trees take up. I could see, you know, how much any particular element that I wanted to in my game, bullets, weapons, you know, towns, I don't know, car parks. Uh, I can also see and, and show to you what, you know, most games are sort of made out of. Most of their memory is really about rendering and about assets. And by assets, I mean meshes and textures for the most part. One thing for me that when I did this experiment uh, surprised me quite a bit um, is how many other allocations I had. I mean, I've got, you know, 1.2 million allocations and assets. And if they're supposed to be big things, what's going on there? Uh, there's actually a whole bunch of entities that glue all of these things together in our engine. And a lot of them are very small, and there's obviously quite a few of them. And that's what's going on in this case. Rendering assets are quite similar to content in the fact that they're nearly like textures and, and buffers used to draw the scene, and those buffers sometimes are a lot like meshes, actually. Uh, another thing that people should note is that code is small compared to all of this, and so data is usually the problem. If you can reformat your data and, and make data faster or data better, then this is a good idea. Trying to figure out how you can compress and make data smaller is usually what you should be focused on. Don't get me wrong, I mean, uh, I don't know, three months ago I was scraping code uh, out of, of ESTL and trying to shrink our executable size uh, back on PowerPC uh, on, <clears throat> on uh, Gen 3, so uh, PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. I mean, so it does happen, and sometimes that is the best way to get back memory. But usually you should look uh, at data first. So I've introduced uh, Del Delta Viewer, and I've shown you all of the different views that we've got. Uh, I've also shown you that I've got lots of work to, left to do. Fortunately, I have a year left, so I'm okay. Uh, I've taught. Uh, a little about the, the differences that we've had between ESTL and STL and how we're trying to track all of that memory and how we're trying to figure out how to debug it. Uh, and maybe using something like um, you made it, you own it kind of style might be a good idea. <clears throat> ESTILICA might be another way to solve this problem. Um, it's an idea. Uh, I'm not sure if it's entirely fully baked, but it, it does seem to work pretty well. And I can give it to a junior engineer, and they will solve it uh, and figure it out right away. And so that's, that's quite good. Uh, finally, I hope you learned a little bit about games in general, you know, what they're made out of, um, how much memory we have, and they're pretty much similar to, to most uh, styles of things. Lots of small allocations, not so many big ones. 
most of its rendering and assets. Uh, you might also have seen that, you know, if you don't have things like stomp allocators, you really should be using them. Um, but I guess if you're on, you know, things like Macs and PCs, then uh, you probably even have better tools than I do. Um, there's a lot of different ways of having large amounts of allocation schemes, and we really do pay attention to it and divide up memory in all sorts of ways based on team or size or, or, or you know, time of life. Uh, besides just the ones that everybody talks about here, where you know it's about performance, you know, fixed size pools and um, you know bump pointer allocators and these kind of things. But uh, I think that's it for for me. Thanks. Anybody have any questions or anything? And want to want a mic? I don't know. Is that on? Yeah, I don't know if it's on. It is on. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so you mentioned earlier that PASTL yeah. is going to be open source. Yes. Um, but there were a few other things that you showed in the talk, such as PH Celica and I, the profiler. Uh, the profiler will not be open sourced. Uh, not yet, anyways. Uh, don't know if that'll change. It I, looks really cool. Oh, yeah, thanks. It, it is pretty neat. Um, I wanted to show people what we do internally. Um, I wish, I hope maybe Stilica or something like that can be. I don't know. We're, I'll work on it uh, behind the scenes and we'll see. I know I've just, just gotten the ability to do STL, um, but I think there is uh, some momentum there, and so maybe there'll be other things that we'll be able to do. I don't know. Thanks. Sad to hear that you're not going to open sources, but um, the next best thing, is there any chance to see the features you showed here in screenshots or something like that, videos, so we can uh, copy that to um, <laughs> other tools like HeapTrack, which I'm working on uh, for Linux Heap profiling? Uh, I, I, wish, I wish I could have done a live demo. I probably could have got away with a live demo, except for the fact that I'm working on a very tiny Mac, and uh, as you saw, it really likes screen space. Um, it's like, 4K is, is pretty good. I mean, I can do it in HD, but yeah, no. I, I'm sorry I didn't make any videos or anything of it. It's pretty new, actually. We just got it internally. Um, I would think, like, the memory stuff we just got in July. Uh, so, I mean, it is really our cutting edge. So, as of yet, uh, I don't know what we'll do with it. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, does ESTL also work with, uh, like, the standard uh, Memory, memory uh, smart pointers like unique pointer and shared pointer, or are they completely uh, off of those, uh, or do they have their own implementation of those newer features? We would have our own implementations of those features as well, and we'll usually put things in ESTL to try and make it like the, the standard. Uh, you would know better than me, but... <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. yeah, come talk to him, and he can tell you more details about it. Uh, I'm, I'm a power user uh, more than I'm an implementer, so. Anything else? Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks, Scott, for that talk. Mm -hmm. um, Mimics. I work at Creative Assembly. Uh, actually, we have spoken before. I'm Guy Davidson. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Hello. Hey. Um, you know, what, you, what you were covering mimics most of what the pains that we've been through at Creative Assembly as well. So it's nice to know it's not just us and that we <laughs> probably are on the right track as well. Uh -huh. The particular question I had was that uh, you were describing how Dinkenware's debug uh, performance was substantially worse than the EASTL performance. That's true. Um, which we also discovered with our own CASTL. Ah, there called. you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, this could get complicated. Um, but we discovered yeah. fairly quickly that this was down to the iterator debug level, and I wondered if you'd take an account of that. What, what is it? Iterator debug level. Uh, no, in, in our case it's not. I've shut off all of, like, the parameters and everything yeah. are fairly optimal. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's a I, I am trying to give it a fair fight. Uh, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to disable all these things. All the, 
I don't know if I left the debug one in the default. I'm pretty sure, though, that, that even in the debug case that I've turned off all of the, the, the default uh, debug attributes and things like that, and I'm not doing, you know, checking to see if I'm off the end or all of those kind of things that you could do in SDL by default. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. One up there too. I can project my voice. I hope. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Want want to? Sorry. Yeah, back back right up top. Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Nice. Um, so, do you have? Um, sort of similar empirical data for how the adoption of these tools actually reduced uh, the bug count in terms of number of bugs or time taken to resolve them on your team? I'm not sure, actually. I know, like, Stomp Allocator was, like, a revolution uh, in the fact that, like, I could just... I started ignoring QA, and I would just go and try and test with this thing, and only once... Uh, I got rid of all the bugs that way uh, that I would start, you know, paying attention to, to you know, QA's um, bug reports because I would know more about the status of the game than, than they do. Um, but besides that sort of uh, non-empirical data, uh, I don't have uh, very much. For uh, EASTL, were there any, you know, intrinsic decisions that allowed you to increase the performance as much as you did for certain cases, or how were you able to get, you know, such big speed ups in certain cases? I, I probably would have to go look at um, Paul Pedriano's paper. Uh, I know we were talking about it on the way in. I think one has to do with um, uh, the memory model of uh, STL versus ESTL. I think we're allowed to have uh, pointers as being our iterators in uh, uh, strings and in vectors. Um, so that's one place. And the other place is, is we don't rely on inlining as much. We do more cutting and pasting. And I think those two count for much of the performance difference uh, off the top of my head, but I, didn't have time to go dig into the numbers because that I knew everybody wanted to know, <laughs> but uh, I haven't had time to, to go into the numbers. Hi, I hey. wanted to ask about intrusive containers. Okay, and yes, we have those. Do you have intrusive containers for all yes. container types or some subset or? Yeah, we only have some subset. We don't have all of them. Um, do you know which ones we have? I think we have, uh, I, mean, I, I can only think of list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, we've been struggling at Blizzard to, to get an uh, intrusive version of chain cache map. Okay. So Interesting. I'm curious if that was one of the ones that you had tested yet. Mm, not, not yet, but that would be interesting. Uh, we do have many other things, but that are, don't get into ESTL. Like people still write their own custom hash tables and things. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely interested in adding intrusive containers as the next move for SG14. So if people are interested, contact me. Yeah. If you guys do, if you guys get them into, you know, SG14, we'll pull them probably into ESTL. <laughs> uh, there's, oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say that the profile you, you, the profile you showed is, is very impressive. Um, mm -hmm. It's has a lot of similarities to Windows Performance Analyzer. Uh, that it does. And I suspect <laughs> that the, uh, the logs that you generate could be turned into ETL files and opened, and much of the functionality could be... Um, or I could use Dtrace, too. Of course, yes. But, <laughs> but that, that, that's not getting open source. I, it may it, not be open source. Um, it, that it, would be, uh, you know, that could be a, an alternative for the rest of us. Uh, no, it's... Uh, it, and there is actually an internal library, and probably, like... There's two forces going on, actually. I bet you this might become a GUI for another thing. I, I can see it happen. As I, as I wrote this, I posted this, and like one of my coworkers is like, 
I want to work on that. I want to do this cool thing with D-Trace. And we're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, with all this tracking turned on, how much slower is your game? Ha, I can't turn it all on at once. <laughs> well, Sorry. You know, the settings you use normally, like for this visualization. Let's say. I, I, I'm actually surprised at how fast it is, actually. Like, for example, um, when we first converted over to the, you know, every single alloc and free sort of model that, that is in that tool, um, I was like, well, in our previous system, we were only able to turn it on just like certain zones at a time. Now I can turn it on everywhere. And, you know, what is it? You know, maybe 10% or something. It's actually really impressive uh, how fast that, that particular one. The profiling one could use maybe a bit more work, uh, mainly because, like, like the things we were talking about, about D-Trace and, and other tools like that, uh, we can probably get better information that, than we currently have, uh, and, and maybe we could implement those better. But, um, you know, um, they're, they're usable in, you know, you're going to lose uh, you know, three or four milliseconds of frame or something to them. Uh, that's not too bad. Uh, I can still play my game in, in real time-ish, uh, uh, as long as you can afford to drop some frames. You showed uh, quite a number of impressive tools. I'm just curious, mm -hmm. uh, what portion of the team's time is spent on tool development as opposed to game development? It's, it's very small. Um, and very big teams could afford to write some of their own tools, um, but in this case, this is one of a, a good reasons to start using, you know, engines. And you can see why what's going on in the the, the gaming community is there's becoming less and less engines because just tooling up for these things is very expensive. Hi. Um. So now that you have all this logging, are you looking at using this to catch regressions in your code? Uh, store sorry? Lo store logs over time, see yes. you know, stuff getting bigger? Uh, yeah, there's a whole other sort of thing that goes on here that I'm not showing. I mean, there's a, a project we call Biometrics because it came from Bioware, uh, where we, you know, we can see uh, all of this data over time, over many, many sessions as well. So, but um, it's, yeah, it seems like it's per team at the moment because teams need different types of data. They look at the problem differently still. Maybe eventually we'll be able to make it more central. Cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.